did a lot of research on aliens and uh, aliens. <coughs> they come from demons. I'll put some links in here where you can see that research, but I wanted to see some people that are totally deceived, or at least one individual. But he's deceived with a reason. That's the scary part. Because it's uh, the deception goes to a, a media outlet that basically presents it to the entire nation, and in some cases, the world. This is it. Over time and time again on these things as you're trying to get the word out that, you know, you're, you're a pretty aware person, you know, as far as that, but you just like go, well, I'm trying to get the word out. Maybe I'll get screwed. Maybe I won't, but I'm just going to go for it anyway. Is that yeah. your attitude or what? Well, it's been my attitude. Now my attitude is, uh, is uh, um, I, I just don't want that to happen anymore, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm very reluctant to uh, to believe what anybody tells me anymore. Right. <laughs> but have you developed an intuitive sense, perhaps? Now, I mean, cause you know how that can do. It can start shutting you down from certain experiences or certain places where you might need to be. Kind well, that's of true, and uh, to a certain extent, um, um, I have an intuitive sense of where somebody's coming from, but it doesn't <laughs> always doesn't always work. Uh huh. You know, that's what makes a con man a good con man, is that you, you get the perception that they're, that they're telling you the truth. Okay. Um, and, and so someone who's really good at it right. can snow you. Mm -hmm. Or me, anyway, I don't know about <laughs> you. Hold on one second. Uh, grab <coughs> yeah, you want to wipe your face or anything? No, you got it. Okay. You all right, Robert? Mm-hmm. Robert, you set? Yes, I am. Scott, you're set? Yes. Bill, you ready? Yep. Bill, well, thanks for uh, agreeing to the interview. Um, first of all, a little bit about your background. You had extensive military service for many years prior to uh, 1970, where a certain aspect of that mili military service kicked upstairs, so you were able to see certain things that you were not able to see beforehand. You, if, would you tell us a little bit about, about that? Uh, it, it actually started much longer uh, in my past than that. I was reared in a military family. My father's an Air Force colonel. He's retired now. He was a command pilot. And as a child, I remember sitting around the, uh, I remember the pilots at our house sitting around the kitchen table uh, talking about their exploits in the cockpit. and. and uh, what they had seen in the skies, and some of that talk involved uh, UFOs and what some of them called Foo Fighters. Uh, and I traveled all over the world, lived on military bases for most of my life. I was really uh, uh, an indoctrinated individual, you might say. I was, I was uh, as establishment as you could get, as gung-ho, pro-government, pro-America, uh, pro-military. And that's why I went into the military. Um, because that had been so much of my life. I went into the Air Force. I was in the Strategic Air Command for four years uh, as an aircraft and missile hydraulic technician, which is, uh, I worked on the, uh, the uh, pneumatic and hydraulic systems of B-52 bombers, KC-135 aircraft, and Minuteman missiles. I had a secret security clearance. Uh, that's where I saw my first atomic bomb. I mean, we worked around in these planes uh, especially the ones on the uh, alert pad were always loaded, ready to go drop these bombs at a moment's notice. But while I was in the Air Force, I met uh, sergeants, men who were older than me, and had been in the Air Force for quite a while, told me that they had participated in projects that had recovered crashed extraterrestrial craft, what you call UFOs. And... Uh, they never told these stories unless they had quite a bit to drink. So I never really believed it. I thought, well, these guys are running a scam on me. You know, even though I'd heard about these things when I was a kid, uh, I just still didn't believe in them. It's just so far out in left field, it's not something that you really give any serious thought to until something personal happens, which came later. While I left the Air Force, I went into the Navy, 
which is really where I wanted to be in the first place. I'd always had this tremendous uh, feeling and connection with the, with the ocean. I was an excellent swimmer. Um, but I had a problem as a, as a child. I, was, I had chronic motion sickness. If I got in a car and we went on a long trip, I got deathly ill. And same with boats or anything. I couldn't ride on the things at the carnival that went around and around uh, because it just made me tremendously ill. But I decided after I had uh, gone through the Air Force experience that, um, sick or not, you know, I was going to go in the Navy because that's really what I had wanted to do. So I did. Volunteered for submarine duty um, and was assigned to the USS Tyru SS-416, which was a diesel electric boat, World War II type, that had been reconfigured. Uh, when I went on board the, the boat, it was in the dry dock at Pearl Harbor Naval Shipyard and had literally been cut in half. They put in a 12-foot sonar section and then three domes on the deck for triangulating targets using sonar. Um, and this was really one of the, um, the most up-to-date electronically submarines that we had. Um, it wasn't a nuclear submarine, but uh, as, as far as the ability to approach, get close to a target and destroy it, um, it, it had a better capacity to do that than any other boat that we had. Um, while we were on a transit from the Portland, Seattle area, on the surface, I actually saw, I was the port lookout, uh, and I saw the most incredible thing that I think I've ever seen in my life. Uh, and, it, and it had such a profound effect upon my view of the universe and the world that we live in um, that I wish everybody could experience this. I saw come up out of the ocean from beneath the surface of the sea a huge disc-shaped craft about the size of a midway class aircraft carrier which is tremendous in size uh, even though that's one of our smallest carriers there was then um, it's still a huge tremendously big object came up out of the ocean and rose into the air and tumbled on its axis and went up into the clouds and I was awestruck, dumbstruck and uh, I mean dumbstruck literally I could not utter a sound uh, and my first um, impulse was to tell the officer of the deck that I'd seen a flying saucer and then luckily for me I couldn't talk uh, because on second thought that's not what I really wanted to say uh, because I didn't want to be the only Looney Tunes character on a submarine with a tight-knit crew that you had to live close in close quarters with uh, uh, because that's uh, that's a hell of a way to live. So I told the officer of the deck that I'd seen something about 15 degrees off the port bow at a relative distance of about two and a half nautical miles. And uh, uh, he began to look in that area. And the starboard lookout had heard me tell him this, and he began to look over there. And while we were all three watching, uh, either the same craft or another one exactly like it came down out of the clouds, tumbled again on its, why it did this maneuver, I don't know, but every single time it did it. It's like it came down in this attitude, and then it flipped over, and then entered the water. Uh, and the water just appeared to open up in front of it. It's just like the, the account in the, in the Bible about the parting of the Red Sea. That's exactly what happened. The sea actually parted, and this thing went into the water, and it closed up behind it. And this big spray went up into the air. But it wasn't a spray from the craft hitting the water. It was a spray from the water coming back in to fill up this hole that had been created. And uh, again, you know, I think this, this is incredible. It's, what are we looking at here? And it was metal. It was a machine. And, and uh, it wasn't glowing or anything like that. It didn't have any lights on it that we could see. Um, but it was obviously metal. And it was obviously a machine. And uh, although I can't tell you that there was anyone inside of it, I believe that there was. Um, and it did something that that, as far as I knew, was absolutely impossible. I'd been in the Air Force, I'd worked on the state of the art of our, of our uh, aviation capabilities, and here I was on the deck of a submarine in the conning tower, and I knew what we had to be able to have to go underwater, and I knew that the two were incompatible. Here's something that came from under the water and flew in the air and performed maneuvers and then came back down and interfaced with the water at tremendous speed uh, and remained intact. 
uh, which realistically it, it, it never touched the water. The water sort of magically opened up in front of it, but something had to interface with that water. Anything that we had that interfaced with the water in that manner would have been disintegrated. It's like hitting a brick wall. So I was looking at a technology that as far as our laws of physics and what we knew at that time didn't exist. This was in 1966. Uh, and um, Ensign Ball was uh, as shocked as I was. He called the captain to the bridge. He came up with the chief quartermaster who brought a camera. And uh, we all stood there and watched this occur over and over again for about 10 minutes. And I still to this day don't know if it was the same craft or a whole bunch of different craft going in and out of the water. But it seemed like that there was a hell of a lot of traffic on that freeway right there. <laughs> and we were watching it as we went by. We never changed course. We never lowered or, or increased our speed. Uh, we made no attempt to communicate or signal. Uh, we made no attempt to get closer. Um, and eventually, uh, it just stopped. We were told not to discuss it with anyone, not even amongst ourselves, which was incredible. I never had been told anything like that in my life. You know, you can't talk about something. And to be told that we couldn't even talk about it amongst ourselves was even more extraordinary, I thought. Um, but we didn't. We didn't talk about it. When we got to uh, Pearl Harbor, oh, all, all the time the chief quartermaster was taking pictures of this. So I know photographs were made. Uh, what happened to those photographs, I have no idea. But when we reached Pearl Harbor, we were not allowed to go ashore to um, to uh, go on liberty, even though we didn't have the duty. And about two hours after we berthed uh, at the submarine base, a commander from the Office of Naval Intelligence came on board and uh, debriefed each one of us individually in the captain's stateroom. And the uh, the ultimate outcome of the debriefing was that uh, we didn't see anything, we didn't hear anything, and we had to read rules and regulations uh, that told us that if we ever talked about what it was that we didn't see, um, that we could uh, be imprisoned, uh, we could be fined uh, $10,000, we could lose all pay and allowances due or ever to become due. And I learned at that moment that the United States Navy didn't want anybody to know um, about what we saw and that uh, severe consequences could come down around the neck of anybody who did. And that was when I understood fully that, uh, yeah, there's a real cover-up. These things do exist, number one, uh, and uh, at least the United States Navy doesn't want anybody to know about it. And there's stiff penalties for anybody who bucks that. Mm -hmm. Moving forward a, a few years from, what, 1966, mm -hmm. I believe, you gained a special security clearance that uh, uh, revealed to you certain documents, or were revealed to you, or that you saw yes. relating to this very uh, cover-up. To this and, and many other things. Um, I was eventually trained um, by Naval Security and Intelligence, and I was given a secondary NEC, which is Naval Enlisted Code, which was 9545, which is Internal Security Specialist. and. Um, uh, an internal security specialist is someone who um, uh, protects classified information and protects uh, um, areas, so to speak. Um, and I had a specialty which I was trained in, which was Pacific Area Intelligence Briefings. And I was eventually assigned to the Commander-in-Chief of the United States Pacific Fleet, who was Admiral Bernard Clary at that time and uh, served as a member of his intelligence briefing team. And basically all that means, we really had a wonderful job. You come in about 4 o'clock in the morning and you go through all the message traffic and all the, everything. And uh, what you do is, you, we, what we did was we prepared an updated briefing on everything that was happening in his half of the world, which he commanded the naval forces uh, and marine forces, as a matter of fact. And, uh, put all this together in a briefing where we would update him on ongoing operations, uh, brief him about operations that were scheduled to begin, um, um, political situations, uh, deployment of Soviet forces, naval forces, um, everything. And uh, after the briefing was finished, uh, between 8 and 10 o'clock in the morning, then we were done, you know, we were finished. Um, so. 
it was what you call fat cat duty or gidunk duty in the Navy. It's got all different kinds of names. It's it's just really a, a wonderful job. Now, to be able to function in this job, I had to have a, a security clearance, which gave me access to the information that I had to need to know to help prepare these briefings. Uh, and when I first uh, was assigned to the command, I was attached to the OPSTAT office under Lieutenant Commander Mercado, uh, which was uh, operational status reporting, and uh, while I waited for my security clearance. And it took six months to get it. What I, origi what I eventually ended up with was a top secret Q clearance uh, with an SCI attachment, which means uh, sensitive compartmentalized information, and there were no blocks. In other words, there, there was nothing confining me to only certain uh, compartmentalized information. I had access to whatever the Admiral and his staff had access to uh, because we had to prepare briefings and brief these people on all of these, these things. And uh, I'm sure that at first uh, I was tested and wasn't shown a whole lot, but eventually uh, when they began to have confidence in me, uh, I began to see things coming across my desk that were just absolutely incredible. And, and a lot of it is, is really hard to talk about because it's so far uh, outside the normal concept of reality for the average American that, uh, that they're going to find a hard time uh, believing any of it. Mm -hmm. But I saw documents that were uh, labeled uh, under the classification top secret and uh, the compartmentalized uh, of the compartment that that was put into was called MAGIC, M-A-J-I-C, mm -hmm. um, which told me that, uh, that UFOs are real, which I already knew. I'd seen one. Right. Uh, but this went farther than that. It told me that they were extraterrestrial in origin, that there were four different extraterrestrial uh, species or races visiting this earth, uh, and that they had actually entered into an agreement with the United States government with one of these uh, species um, of alien beings to exchange technology and it told me all the projects that that uh, was underneath this uh, uh, project red light was actually the testing of extraterrestrial craft um, uh, project Plato was a diplomatic project uh, pounce was the recovery of technology uh, Pluto was the uh, the application of that technology to our own secret space program, not the public space program. There are two different space programs. One is the, what the public gets to see, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, overseen by NASA, and the other one is a secret space program that nobody gets to see, which is really overseen by um, uh, the Navy Department uh, under, under specialized, uh, uh, compartmentalized black yeah. projects. And, uh, and, and, and what these people are doing in secret is just absolutely incredible. I also saw uh, documents under an operation called Operation Majority, which uh, outlined the plans to bring together a one-world government and also included extraterrestrial information within that. Um, uh, project Grudge, which was uh, the second project. First was Sign and then Project Grudge which contained all of the extraterrestrial information up to a certain point, I forget the year cutoff, and then it was contained after that in another project uh, called Project Aquarius, which was the accumulation of the whole history of alien inter interaction on, on planet Earth. Um, but I have to say at this point that I don't know if those documents were really telling the truth or not. They could have been showing me these things so that eventually I would go out and talk about this. And uh, maybe that will become clear to you later why they may have done that. Um, it could be real. So. Mm -hmm. but at, this, at this point, person, from a personal standpoint, what was it that, you know, based on your experience in 66, and they said, do not, absolutely do not reveal this to anybody. And <coughs> here we are a few years later, and you're seeing documents that prove that you saw, what you saw was real. Mm -hmm. What was the one factor or a number of factors that led you to the decision to say, I've got to get this out, I've got to tell people about this? I saw contingency plans called Majestic. And these contingency plans were to, um, well, first place, a contingency is a plan that can be implemented if certain things occur. Right. And the certain things that would have tripped this contingency plan are, number one, 
the public sector is getting too close to the truth, so they have to implement this to get them steered off the track. R number two, we don't want to tell the public the truth about the alien presence, but there is so much alien um, activity. activity occurring that the public is on the verge of finding out any, anyway. Let's tell them this story so that it doesn't cause uh, um, consequences that we don't want. And that plan was called Majestic. I was in a bookstore one time. I'd never seen UFO magazine. Didn't know. Didn't even know it exists. In fact, I didn't even know that there was a UFO culture in the world of people who uh, who uh, study UFOs or worship UFOs or have little UFO meetings. I had no idea that that was occurring. I was in a bookstore one time, and I was looking at the magazine rack. I'm an avid reader, and I'm always in bookstores. And and this one day, I saw a magazine just popped right out at me that <laughs> UFO. And I picked it up, and I looked inside, and here is Majestic, all right there. And even, even the people who had been named to implement the plan were the ones who were actually implementing it. Uh, William Moore, Stanton Friedman, I'd never heard of Jamie Chandray, but he was named, and they had brought out a, a supposed genuine document called the Eisenhower Briefing Document, which in reality is a fraudulent document. It's a, it's a fake, and it was created to implement the plan Majestic, to uh, either indoctrinate the public on what the government wants the public to perceive is happening or to, uh, to steer uh, researchers away from the truth, or both. So this wasn't uh, revealing the plan of Majestic, but it was actually uh, uh, implementing the plan. Implementing you, the you plan against the public. It was a psychological operation against the okay, public. Okay, so this is what you saw. Right. So... Uh, Immediately, I began, my head began to spin around, and I began to think, God, you know, uh, I, I've got to uh, tell people that they're, they're being manipulated. This is a lie. And it really, if, if the public were using their own intellect, they would know that it was a lie. The executive order quoted for, the, for, for the, uh, this document was uh, in the 92,000 something. I believe it was 92447, uh, which is 92,447. And it was supposedly written by Truman. But Truman never wrote an executive order higher than 9,000. I mean, even today, there's no executive order with the, with the number 92,000 on it. They've been consecutive since, since the beginning. So it was clearly fraudulent. So it's clearly fraudulent, but the public doesn't catch on to this. And uh, here you've got Stanton Friedman, one of the guys who implemented the, the contingency plan, Majestic, running around the country telling everybody it's not an executive order, it's a date. Uh, September 24th, 1947, um, which it very well could be a date. But it's listed in that document as being an executive order of the President of the United States, Harry Truman. Uh, and, and because of that, it's fake. And, uh, and many other things. But specifically, that is the most glaring uh, proof of uh, fraudulent intent. Uh, in the document. There are many other things in the document that also prove it's a forgery. But here they are. They're running this contingency plan, and here I am. I know all about it, and here's the public out there biting it. They even ran that thing in the New York Times, mm. uh, like a two- or three-page spread showing all the documents. Uh, so it had tremendous credibility lent to it by that action. And uh, so I decided uh, that, I, that I had to tell the public and uh, get people on the right track, which is, the right track is don't believe anybody. Okay. Don't believe me. Don't believe George Bush. Don't believe anyone. you got to go out and you got to get proof in your hand before you can believe anything. And to do otherwise today is, is the biggest mistake that anyone can ever make. Um, you begin believing people, uh, putting your trust in them, that they're telling you the truth, I guarantee you you're going to take a ride on a roller coaster you don't want to be on. Mm -hmm. Now this this controversy, and I, I say the very the very understatement controversy. Yes. <laughs> uh, it it also is now extending based on some things that you're revealing uh, into the Kennedy assassination. Yes, in the in the set of documents, which really was literally two or three file cabinets of documents, called Operation Majority. Uh, I saw documents which told me what happened in Dallas and why. And uh, basically what these documents said was that uh, the intelligence community felt that John F. Kennedy was a threat to the national security. 
which translated into reality means was a threat to the New World Order, the one world government which they were uh, actively um, in the process of forming. Was there anything on record that indi indicated that he was out to, uh, well, things that he, he did would threaten that New World Order? Oh, absolutely. He had written an executive order. I don't remember the exact number now, but it's available to anybody that wants to go look it up. Uh, he had written an executive order uh, ordering the printing of United States notes, which would have broken the back of the Federal Reserve, which is one of the major instruments of propelling the United States into the New World Order by destroying our, our economy, the basis upon which we live. Mm -hmm. um, the basis upon which our, our whole society is founded is, is being ripped right out from under us. Um, that was one. Number two, he refused to provide air support for the invasion of Bay of Pigs, which ensured that that would be a failure. He had threatened publicly on several occasions to disband the CIA and scatter it to the thousand winds. Uh, he had uh, ordered, in, in the documents that I saw, he had ordered the intelligence community prepare a plan to disclose the truth about UFOs to the public. Now, I don't know what that truth was. Could be that maybe there are no extraterrestrials. But whatever the truth was, he had ordered a plan to be prepared that that disclosure was going to be done according to that plan within the following year. And uh, the intelligence community consider that to be out of the question. And uh, according to the documents that I saw, his assassination was ordered by the policy committee of the Bilderberg Group, which is really the secret world government, and was carried out by agents of Division 5 of the FBI, the Secret Service, the Central Intelligence Agency, and the Office of Naval Intelligence, of which I was a part, in Dallas. And it said that the assassin, the man who actually administered the head wound, was the driver of the car, William Greer, a Secret Service agent, who used an assassination pistol built by the CIA for assassinations that was really an air gun um, that fired an exploding pellet or could fire a small hypodermic needle or a poison dart uh, using any one of many uh, different uh, deadly poisons. Specifically, it said that he fired an exploding pellet which contained shellfish toxin and that the act was plainly visible in a film withheld from the public. I looked for 16 years to find that film, and I finally found a copy that showed William Greer turn around and shoot the president. And since 1988, I've been uh, um, showing that film wherever I'm, I, I'm able to show it to wake people up. It is not our government, though you have to understand, that is doing these things. It is not our government that's failing us. It's not the Constitution or the Bill of Rights that is, that's a bad instrument. It is a group of men who belong to secret societies, who have infiltrated our society and our government at all levels, and are destroying it and subverting it from within. And every member of naval intelligence that I knew who was an officer was uh, a 32nd or a 33rd degree Freemason. And I asked my uh, commanding officer at one point, I said, why are all you guys Masons? He said, Masons are used to keeping secrets. It's part of their fraternity. So if you want someone who already knows how to keep a secret, you recruit Freemasons. Well, later on, I found out what the truth is. The truth is, is you're not going to be a naval intelligence officer unless you are a Freemason or a member of the ancient order of the Rosen Cross, but you have to be high degrees uh, for that. I think the reason I was selected as enlisted men is because I belonged to the Demolay Society. Which is why? As a teenager. That's sort of the first level of Freemasonry. That's okay. how they recruit teenagers uh, and indoctrinate them into their principles so that they go right into Freemasonry when they become an adult. Um, so, uh, basically, that's the story. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, based on the information that you're revealing, which would seem to be equally or if not more of a threat than what Kennedy was originally planning on doing, is, is actually revealing the underlying cause of all of this. Why is it that you are here today, or how is it that you are here today, and you're not, you know, take, conveniently taken away and put in a padded cell somewhere so that you can't speak of these things? Well, I really don't know um, the true answer to that question because you would have to ask them to find out why they haven't done anything. Uh, but I can tell you this: I began to reveal information in 1976 and I uh, was uh, physically attacked on two occasions 
my skull was caved in. That's what all these scars are here. Um, on the second attack, I lost my leg. They visited me in the hospital. They had no intention of killing me. They were delivering a message to me. Shut up. And that was the message that came through loud and clear. Uh, and uh, two men who identified themselves with uh, identification cards who belonged to the Defense uh, Investigative Service, which was really the Defense Intelligence Agency, mm -hmm. um, asked me if I was going to shut up or they were going to have to, uh, to uh, do it right. And I told them, I said, you don't have to worry about me. I'm going to be a good little boy for the rest of my life, and uh, yeah, I'm going to shut my mouth. And I did for 16 years. Kept silent until I saw this, uh, this uh, UFO magazine uh, in a bookstore, which indicated that they had implemented the, the contingency plan called Majestic. Uh, but if you want to know what I think the reason is, mm -hmm. uh, I believe that there are several. One, they've had a, a plan that's been in force since the 40s. Uh, to debunk, ridicule, destroy anybody who ever talks about these subjects. And the public has been thoroughly indoctrinated that uh, if you talk about any of these things that I'm talking about, you're just another nut. Mm -hmm. uh, so the public, by and large, doesn't pay any attention to it. So in that sense, I'm not a threat. If the president had come on television and said, hey, this is what's going on, then they would have listened and they'd pay attention to it. Uh, but people like me, they perceive me as being just another loony bin, fruitcake, a nut, which uh, I assure you I'm not, but that's the perception that they've been brainwashed into believing, uh, and so that's what they believe. Mm -hmm. um, number two, I am so much in front of the public from the very beginning when I began to talk, uh, and that's how I protected myself, or, or at least that's what I thought would protect me, and so far it's proven to be right, was that if I got literally in front of the public overnight, in front of a large public um, that they wouldn't do anything to me because it would substantiate what it was that I'm saying. And they certainly don't want to do that. It would also create a martyr. And martyrs create tremendously dangerous political movements that they don't want that either. Mm -hmm. um, so literally, within a 24-hour period, I spent $27,000 mailing a thick packet of information all over the world to people I'd never heard of, didn't know, we went down and got some mailing lists and just mailed the stuff all over the world. And so literally, when people opened these packages in their mailbox, uh, and it, it was a perfect plan because they couldn't stop it. They didn't even know I was going to do it in the first place. Um, and since we sent it all over the world, once it was out, there's no way they could retrieve it. At least no way that I can conceive of. So literally within 24 hours, I was um, um, a public presence. And people were asking all over the world, who's Bill Cooper? Is this true? Look what I got in the mail. Mm -hmm. And uh, just literally flipped the, flipped the world over on its ear. Um, and I've been in front of the public ever since. So I think basically those are the reasons. They don't believe that the public's really going to listen to me. Okay. And so far, that's, that's been true. There is a small group of people all over the world who are awakening Mm -hmm. who are beginning to understand that they've been living their life in fantasy land and who are actively seeking the truth. But by and large, when, when the secret power structure says, as I've put in the first chapter of my book, right out of one of their own technical manuals, that a nation or world of people who do not use their intelligence are no better than animals who do not have intelligence and thus are stakes on the table by choice and consent. They're absolutely right about the majority of people. Mm -hmm. It's one of the things that, uh, that, that has been an illumination to me is that they're not always wrong. Mm -hmm. And many of their goals are the right goals, but the method that they're using to reach that goal is the wrong method. In other words, if you set out to create a perfect world where there will never be any more killing, but to reach that point, you kill two billion people, you have become what, what you're, you're trying, trying to, avo yeah. to avoid. Right. And uh, it can't happen that way. Mm -hmm. If you want to create a world of peace, it has to be done by Very people, peace, peaceful methods. Means. Yeah, if you, if you murder someone to destroy a murderer. You have become what it was you set out to destroy, and thus it wasn't destroyed at all. It was perpetuated by that very action. And that's what these men are doing. 
they rationalize everything they do so that they feel better about it. Mm -hmm. But what they are doing is becoming what it is that they want to get rid of. And the world will never be a safe place for anyone as long as there are men who do these things. Very eloquently said. Thank you. Thank now, you. Your, your message to people, once again, is don't believe anything. How right. is it that the public can find this and you know search for this truth on their own if they can't believe anything or anyone? What, what can it's they all, do? It's all in the public sector. It's all available to anyone who actively and diligently um, seeks it out. Um, everything that's, that's in my book, Behold a Pale Horse, is all, everything in here, all the documents that are in here, mm -hmm. everything that's in this book is in the public Can domain. Can be substantiated? Yes, and I intentionally wrote this book not using anything that wasn't available to the public to show people that yes, if I can find this information, so can you. I have tons of stuff that's not available to the public. But as you can see by reading this book, you don't need that stuff because it's what you need is available to you. Uh, public libraries are, are, are overflowing with with the proof of what's really going on in the world, but nobody really utilizes it to the extent that, they, that they're able to pick this out and put it together. Another thing I've done for people is I've put it together for them so that mm -hmm. they can see the overall picture rather than looking at small um, things and, and thinking that it's isolated. Nothing is isolated. It's all part of a big puzzle. Mm -hmm. And the puzzle is coming together. And when the puzzle is assembled, it's going to be a one-world totalitarian socialist government that nobody's going to like except the people that are running it. It's Hitler all over again. And the rationalization is, we're going to create the world without war. The utopia. The utopia. But they will never create that utopia because they're not dealing with the problem that makes them want to create it. And that is the inherent flaw in each individual human being that makes us do the things that we do. Until that's overcome, there's never going to be a world without war or without rape or without killing or without robbery. And anybody that thinks that there is has already gone off the deep end. So the method is, here, I'm going to hold a gun to your head so you won't rape, you won't kill. That's right. Very, yes, okay, I understand. The title of your book, Behold a Pale Horse, what significance does that have? What are you, what are you saying with this title? This title is, is from the book of Revelations, because I, I have to tell you this, and, and you may think I'm nuts if you want to, uh, but this is the truth. Either these men are following the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation as is, is it, it is in the, in the Bible, mm -hmm. they're either following it just like a plan, and bringing the prophecies in there to pass to manipulate and control those who believe in those prophecies and neutralize them, so to speak. In other mm -hmm. words, uh, if this is written in the Bible and God has ordained it, who am I to resist? It must come to pass, so I'm not going to. I'm not going to try to stop it. Okay. What a perfect way to neutralize the opposition right off the bat. Or there really is a God. And what he said was going to come to pass is coming to pass. And I named this, Behold a Pale Horse, from uh, chapter 13 of the book of Revelations. The fourth horse, the fourth horseman of the apocalypse is the pale horse. And I looked, and behold a pale horse. And his name that sat upon him was death. And hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger, and with the beasts of the earth. And that is taking place now today. The fourth horseman is riding across the world now. That's what AIDS is all about. That's what all these little brush fire wars all over the world are all about. That's what's happening. That's why cancer cures are suppressed. It's because they fully intend to kill a minimum of two billion people by the year 2000. AIDS is an invention of man. It is not a natural disease, and it has been implemented and placed into the population as a population control. And when they did it, they had the cure before they did it. Mm -hmm. And when they deem that enough people have died or been killed, they will say, we have a cure for AIDS. And everybody will be 
called to report to some place to get an inoculation, which is going to do two things. One, it's going to stop AIDS in its tracks, and number two, it's going to implant a device which will be able to be used to track each individual person and maybe even to control those people. And that's what the pet implant program is all about. It's not about finding lost pets. They don't give a damn about pets, and they would never put a satellite in orbit to find a lost pet, but yet there's a satellite up there that they're using to find pets that have been implanted with these devices. They're testing this program on pets that's going to be used in human beings. And in the Los Angeles Times in 1989, they ran an article that was 10 forecasts for the coming decade, was the title of the article. I have a copy of it in my research center. And number five, I believe it was number five, uh, in those ten forecasts for the coming decade was chemical or electronic implants to control individual behavior on a 24-hour basis, unquote. So it's not hidden at all. It's there for anybody who wants to look. But nobody's looking. Nobody's looking. Um, they believe, and I believe that they're right, that the, the biggest danger to mankind right now is man himself, population. Um, a study in 1957 told them that by 1990 the world population would double. In 33 years, can you imagine that? The world population of human beings doubled in 33 years? Mm -hmm. And they knew that it's an exponential doubling throughout history. Every time it's doubled, the interval has gotten shorter. So that was 33 years. The next doubling will take place in approximately 28 years. The next one after that, approximately 24 years. Can you imagine if the world population doubles again in 28 years from 1990? In other words, in the year 2018, the world population doubles? And we're having problems with food supplies and, and timber and clean water and clean air now? And then after that, it doubles again in another 24 years. That's why they created AIDS. Because they didn't want to have to go around the world and say, you, you, and you up against the wall, you've got to die today, and shoot them. They did it in a manner to where they could target what they consider to be undesirable populations. And I want it very clear that I don't agree with them on this. Um, they specifically targeted blacks, Hispanics, and homosexuals for complete eradication. And AIDS is really going through those populations, uh, and, and it's really doing a number of that blacks, theory, Hispanics, and homosexuals. That theory has made uh, news. I've heard that before, and, well, and it's been debunked theory. very clear I, by the public saying, oh, that's ridiculous, but you're saying that well, that may indeed be the case. It's, it's not ridiculous. I actually saw this in documents, and oh, the project okay. name was Project Naomi, M.K. Naomi was the name of it, it was a CIA project, the AIDS, uh, AIDS, whatever causes AIDS, whatever that turns out to be, according to those documents, was developed at Fort Detrick, Maryland, under a CIA project called MK Naomi. Uh, it was financed by $10 million for the uh, Department of the Army's biological warfare uh, programs. It was carried out, uh, supervised by the CIA, carried out by scientists who worked for the Special Operations Division of the Department of Defense. Um, and uh, it's 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 going. It's doing its job. <laughs> and would you assume if AIDS doesn't work, there's a contingency plan for that even? Well, I think that they have other things out there working concurrently. One thing I've learned about these men is they don't just do one thing. In case the public discovers what they're doing, or discovers that somebody's doing, whether they know who's really doing it or not, and stops it, um, what they have running is several concurrently running plans so that if one or two fail, the other ones are going to take care of the problem. It sounds pretty hopeless, I mean, based on that scenario. Is there anything, any, any, any uprising or what? Yeah, there is, but it requires that people wake up. It requires that they really learn the truth instead of live their life in fantasy land. You see, because nothing can exist without the consent of the people. Unless they buy it, it's not going to happen. And all of these plans are lead to the public's ultimate acceptance of what they're going to do. In fact, they're designed to make the public ask for it. For instance, hmm. the burning of the rainforest in Brazil. I know people who are just up in arms. Stop this. We've got to stop the burning of the rainforest. 
which is exactly what the burning of the rainforest is designed to do. Because Brazil is a sovereign nation, right? How can you tell a sovereign nation to stop burning its own forest? You can't. What they're asking for is control over a sovereign nation by a world governing body who can then send troops, a police force, to make Brazil stop burning the rainforest. And that's why they started the burning of the rainforest in the first place. You see, they went down there and they built a road across the Amazon jungle that went nowhere. There was no reason for this road to be built. There was no place to go. It doesn't go from here to a city on the other side. It just goes across the jungle and ends. And they built this road on purpose because they knew that most of the people in Brazil are so dirt poor that they would see this road as the answer to their prayers. Free land, free timber, a way to support their family, a way to become wealthy, or at least more wealthy than they were, which was no wealthy. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what happened. Millions of people headed out down this road and staked out some land and burned the forest and tried to grow crops. And they found that rainforest is no good for growing crops. It'll grow one crop, and then you've got to go burn more trees and plant another crop because the, the soil is poor. Um, and that's what's happening. Mm -hmm. And that's why the forest is being burned. And it was done intentionally to create the scream of stop burning the rainforest so that then they could offer the solution. The solution is a world governing body that can then order and enforce that order of Brazil to stop burning so the, the rainforest. So the, the green movement worldwide is As now a manipulation. just a manipulation yes. of... Now it's been... It's been uh, proposed time and again too that big business is behind things like this and that would uh, present, represent a capitalist approach but what you're saying is we're heading toward a socialist approach based on uh, this scenario. You have to understand the difference between capitalism, socialism, communism, what all of these things really mean. Um, you have to understand that, uh, that uh, w what the difference is between right wing and left wing. People, they use these phrases all the time and they don't even know what these things mean. And it's just incredible to me to hear a socialist calling someone else a Nazi. Because Nazi means national socialism. So here's a socialist calling a right-wing guy a Nazi when he, what he should be calling the right-wing guy is anarchist. People on the right want no control. Mm -hmm. They're really anarchists. Okay. So they would, in, in theory then, or in fact, be uh, in opposition to this <coughs> ultimate movement. Yes. W whereas in appearance, they would be the ones behind it. Well, it, when you have a misunderstanding of what the terms mean, yes. Okay. Right wing, on the far right, is total anarchy. They don't want anybody controlling anything that they do, and they believe that people are responsible enough that the world can exist without government. Okay. Are the very minimal government that it would take uh, to... On the far left, on the other hand, they believe that the government should be in total control and should be uh, supply man with all of his needs. Well, cre creating a whole society that's uh, um, dependent. Right. A republic is somewhere in the middle. It's governance by laws. Laws are decided by representatives who are elected by the people. And according to the theory, the representatives will do what is right, whether they get elected or not, because it's not really a democracy. A democracy is far left. People don't understand. We don't live in a democracy. This country is not a democracy. It is a republic. A democracy is ruled by the mob. The mob always votes themselves every kind of benefit mm -hmm. that they can vote themselves. And whenever you do that, it means large, tremendously overpowering government. government in control. They vote themselves into dependency. That's it. Okay. They vote themselves into a dictatorship is what they do, where they lose all of the benefits that they, they intended to vote themselves into in the first place. Okay. Um, and democracies are extremely dangerous to minorities, because if the majority of people don't like you, right. they're going to vote that they kill you, and they can, you know that's it. Democracies are dangerous. Democracies are socialists. Democracies are communism. That's what communism is. The definition of communism is everybody doing according to their talents mm -hmm. and receiving according to their need. 
Um, and it doesn't work. We already know it doesn't work. Men, by his inherent nature, is greedy. Mm -hmm. So those at the top always end up having everything, and those at the bottom end up having nothing in communism. Socialism is different. Socialism usually ends up in a dictatorship, in a very controlling dictatorial government which even owns the people that it governs, so that those who live in fear of not having are provided for what they need, and in turn they worship this oppressive government. Socialists are children who went out into the world, took a look around and said, I can't handle it, and went home to Daddy. Okay. Daddy, protect me. Daddy, feed me. Daddy, loan me your car. Daddy, tuck me in at night. Socialists are scared little children who are irresponsible, can't stand on their own two feet, and need Daddy to take care of them. Okay. Okay? And now we got the... But what happens one. when you go home to Daddy, and Daddy does all these things for you? Tell me. Well, you never leave the home. You've not got no reason to. In other words, if you're being provided for in that way. You're being provided for, but what does it mean? Doesn't it mean that you have to do what Daddy tells you to do? True. Doesn't you're mean you have to be rules. in when Daddy tells you to be in? Doesn't it mean that you can't drive the car to the next town if Daddy tells you you can't? Doesn't it mean that if Daddy tells you to take out the trash, you better take out the trash? Are you beginning to understand the concept? Mm -hmm. When you ask for favors from Daddy, you have to give up freedom in return. Right. Okay. So socialism always leads to repression of liberty, freedom, equality, all of those things fly out the window so that you can have free health care, mm -hmm. so that you can have a place to live but you don't have to pay the rent, so that you can have food given to you by the state. And that's where we're headed. Right in this country right now, we're almost totally socialist, and now people are screaming for a national health care policy. Right. Health care insurance. Now, the, the, the other aspect, once again, I'd like to go into is the anarchy or the right wing, which we uh, just into that similar. Anarchists believe that they can be responsible, that they won't hurt other people. Okay. That your freedom never ends until it begins to infringe upon someone else's freedom. And that no one should have any control over that. That there should be no speed limits on the highways. Mm -hmm. The problem is that, again, just like on the socialist side, you have people over here that are human, and human condition means that ultimately somebody's not going to be responsible, that they're going to drive too fast when they've had too much to drink, and they're going to kill innocent people. The answer is a balance. You know, the, the law of the universe says this. It's a law of physics, really, and everybody can understand it. For every action, there is an equal but opposite reaction. There can be no good unless there is evil. There can be no man without a woman. You, you understand right. the concept? Ba based that, on that, the theory of a utopia here on Earth is corrupt right away. Absolutely. It, does, it goes against the laws of physics. It goes against the law of the universe that there must be two opposing forces all the time in every instance because that's what makes the universe work. Mm -hmm. That's what makes everything work. What we need to do is stop trying to go way over here and establish some utopia of freedoms or way over here to establish some repression of freedom so that we make sure that we got something on the table to eat. Mm -hmm. and strike a balance between the two that works and stop withholding information what makes it difficult for anyone to succeed or live or for us to really come together and have peace in this world are all of these people who think that they are the guardians of the secrets of the ages and have only them have truly mature minds so only them are worthy of knowing the secrets and the real science and the real metaphysics and all of these things so they repress it and they keep it secret so the rest of us live out our lives and we don't know the truth of what life is really all about therefore we're always stumbling over each other and getting in each other's way and doing the things that we profess that we don't want to do mm -hmm. simply because we don't have access to the truth 
if we had access to the truth. Now, I've got to tell you this. Back when these men first began establishing these societies, these mystery schools, and, and suppressing information, the common man was uneducated, did not have an intellect capable of understanding these secrets. They were really beasts of burden for the most part, mm -hmm. and they lived their whole life in toil. Right. But things are not that way now. Most people have a good education. They have a good mind. They're capable of understanding if they're taught and if they're taught correctly. And I think it's time to teach people what the truth is and quit hiding it so that we can come together as one humanity and make a balance and live together in a balance. You know, evil's never going to disappear. Mm -hmm. Neither is good. But we can maintain a balance and life can be good instead of swinging back in this tremendous battle between these two opposing, radical, extreme ends of the scale. That's got to stop. I've never understood why somebody would join together in this band of people and call himself a Democrat and not vote for anybody else if they're not a Democrat. That concept is beyond my understanding. Mm -hmm. and Republicans and Libertarians and Populists and Communists and Socialists and this and that and Blacks and Whites and uh, Indians and there are so many sects and groups and segments and we're so fragmented that getting together is going to really be difficult mm -hmm. but we've got to do it uh, because if we don't wake up and do it ourselves these men who meet in secret and plot the manipulations are going to do it whether we want it or not and they're going to do it at the point of a gun Mm -hmm. and they're going to take away everybody's freedom because they don't consider us responsible capable of having that freedom are capable are even of using our intellect uh, so they'll put us in shackles and control us and force us to be peaceful mm -hmm. that's what the plan is and that's what the new world order is all about well we've, we've, we've run a, uh, from, from UFOs right to this and at first, a person might watch this and say, wow, this is really strange. But where we've come down to, uh, based on that beginning, is quite quite in the, the realm of common sense. Well, it's not strange at all. It's, it's what they've been trained all their life, that if they hear these buzzwords, mm -hmm. they're listening to some loony idiot talk, and it has no substance to it. Um, once they get into it, though, and begin to understand that everything is interconnected, it's leading us toward one end. Mm -hmm. a one-world totalitarian socialist government and begin to see it coming to pass all around them in their life and understand that that nothing happens by accident it's been planned for many years then they begin to understand that uh, UFOs play a big role in this because if they're real it's the most significant thing that's ever happened in the history of man and may be the driving force behind locking up the human race. Mm -hmm. Because how could a UFO land in a place like Macon, Georgia, and somebody who doesn't look like us get up, get out, walk down the street? And I'm not trying to insult the citizens of the state of Georgia. Yeah. What if they landed in Newark, New Jersey, and got out and walked down the street in a society that kills people because they sit in the wrong seat on a bus? I'd assume now that they'll know about us. Of course they will. They probably already know about you if you've been exposing the truth on your show. So do you assume that our, 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 uh, our phone lines would be bugged at this point? I don't know. I doubt it. They don't really uh, consider you to be a threat unless you develop a large political following. Oh, okay. So unless you have a large political following, you're not considered to be a threat okay. to them. Because okay. they figure that the people are too stupid to listen to you anyway. And generally, they're right. <laughs> so we're in the process of educating people, then. It's yeah. the best thing. Education is 60 or 70 percent of the battle. Yeah. Because people automatically begin to do the right things once they learn what the truth is. They're educated to it. Let's go back into the uh, Kennedy uh, situation here. Now, uh, the Warren Commission was highly publicized, all the things that went on there. I was, I, was, I was shown a videotape just yesterday 
uh, of a, was it a Z Zapruder film? It is the Zapruder film. Okay, and it clearly showed to me that uh, a number of things, one in which that the film was obviously tampered with. Absolutely. But, <laughs> but not tampered with to the point where I couldn't tell that the driver of the limousine was pulling a gun, or what appeared to look like a gun, around his shoulder and shooting uh, President Kennedy in the head. That caused his head to snap back. Did the Warren Commission see this? It seems so. The Warren Commission never looked at the Zapruder film, ever. Uh, so they never saw it. Now, I don't know who testified during the Warren Commission about the Zapruder film, if anybody did. Uh, but I do know that later at the uh, investigations of the House Select Committee on Assassinations that a man was specifically hired as an expert witness to view the Zapruder film and tell the committee what it showed. Uh, and that man's name is Robert Groden. He wrote High Treason, which is a bestseller out now on the Kennedy assassination. And uh, he was one of the many so-called technical uh, experts for the filming, making of Oliver Stone's film called JFK. He's also a fake, a fraud, a traitor, a liar. Uh, he uh, was hired by the House Select Committee on Assassinations based upon his resume, which says, very simply, that he is the world's foremost number one photo analyst, uh, which is a lie. He never went to school in photography. He never was a photographer. He never was a photo analyst, and I got to tell you right now that the world's number one foremost photo analysts are all come out of the military intelligence community, uh, who are trained to interpret um, high altitude photography and, and learn what what really is there. Uh, he never served in that capacity either. Uh, he looked at the Zapruder film and he told Congress, he told the committee in testimony, he testified, both in written and in verbal. Uh, form that William Greer never took his hands off the steering wheel, and that's a blatant lie. I mean, anybody can look at the Zapruder film mm -hmm. and see that William Greer takes his hands off the, the steering wheel, and even if you couldn't see it, if they cut out the frames, you can still see that William Greer, if this were the seat of the car, is turned all the way around with his right side against the rear cushion of the front seat, looking directly at President Kennedy in this attitude, and it is a physical impossibility to have both hands on the wheel in that attitude. Mm -hmm. uh, so we know that Robert Groden, number one, was not who he said he was, had no expertise to be doing the job that he was hired to do. Number two, uh, even if he had no expertise, it is plainly visible in the film that William Greer could not possibly have had both hands on the wheel. So we know that Robert Groden didn't make a mistake. We know that he intentionally lied to deceive Congress and thus the American people. And what's real strange about it is he's been very active in the research community, um, supposedly exposing the assassination of President Kennedy. But if you look what he does, he is constantly coming up with new theories, supposed new evidence, most of which is fake. Uh, and in his book now, High Treason, he makes a statement that, uh, that Kennedy was probably hit from the front and the rear at the same time. His job is to keep the American people confused and propagate the lie that our government is no good, that it's our government who assassinated John F. Kennedy. And I'm here to tell you, it wasn't our government. It was the secret societies known as the Illuminati, the Knights Templar, uh, the Freemasons, who assassinated John F. Kennedy. And the proof is right there for anybody who wants to see it. William Greer was a Freemason, number one. He was the Secret Service agent who, who shot Kennedy. Number two, in Dealey Plaza, there's an obelisk a monument commemorating the location of the first Masonic temple in the state of Texas. Dealey Plaza is on the 33rd parallel, which is one of the sacred numbers in Freemasonry. He was assassinated in a manner that assured the greatest flow of blood, which is called blood atonement, which was practiced by Freemasonry in the early days and supposedly is, is not practiced now. But in reality, is, is the method of choice of execution, trial and execution by Freemasons. The Bilderberg Group that orders his execution is the Supreme World Council of Freemasonry and consists of 39 permanent members, which is 3 times 13, which is also the exact number of men who signed the Constitution. 39. You see, our forefathers were also members of this secret group, and this country was founded 
to bring about the New World Order. And it's all in the great seal of the United States, which was, and that, the design of the great seal was made law in 1782. Uh, it's just absolutely incredible that the American people don't understand that groups of men don't get together and meet in secret and take blood oaths, of, which say that uh, they can be cut open and their heart ripped out of their body and their intestines scattered over the floor if they talk about the secrets. That's not a benevolent fraternity. That's a dangerous group of men. Grown men don't play games like that. They're serious. Um, it's the secret societies who are, who are bringing about the New World Order. They're the ones who killed John F. Kennedy. There's nothing wrong with our Constitution or our Bill of Rights. But Americans are going to be convinced that our government sucks. And that's what, what all this stuff is all about. So at the beginning, the... The founders of this country actually did create what was a, I, I guess you could say, an above-board, good, good government basis, basis for a good oh, yes. government. They gave us every tool to ensure the success. But it was an experiment, you see, because man had always claimed that he could rule himself, but had never been allowed to do that. Even in ancient Rome, they call it a democracy. The man didn't rule himself. He was ruled by other people who made man think he was ruling himself. But the truth was, a Roman centurion could march down the street and grab anybody they wanted to and make you do whatever they wanted to or just execute you on the spot. And that was the truth of the matter. Those weren't free people. In the history of the world, there had never been a people who were truly free or who truly ruled themselves until the United States of America was created as a republic by which we ruled ourselves through elected representatives whom we sent to the state house, either in the states or, or to Congress. Um, to do it. They also gave us every tool by which we would destroy ourselves if we weren't capable of doing it. The United States and France, the revolution in this country and the revolution in France were created to bring about governments which would function as the antithesis to the kings and queens of the world and cause them to topple off their thrones. It also gave man a chance to prove once and for all whether he could rule himself or not. And if he could, fine. That would be the New World Order. If he couldn't, they built the tools into the Constitution to allow them to take it away from us. And those tools are the creation of the federal democracy within the boundaries of Washington, D.C., and the right to contract through which if we were irresponsible, we would contract to receive rights from that federal democracy and thus in return give up our freedom. And that's exactly what's happening. It's exactly what we've done. John F. Kennedy was short-circuiting the New World Order. He had ordered the printing of constitutional money, United States notes, which would have uh, destroyed the Federal Reserve, which is not an agency of the United States government. It's a private corporation owned and operated by the world bankers, controlled by the Illuminati. And its purpose was to destroy the middle class in this country and thus our economy and throw us at the mercy of the New World Order. And we see this unfolding now. You see it unfolding now. You are seeing, and I predicted this well in advance, you are seeing the destruction of the economy of the United States. And it will continue. It will not get better. It's downhill from here on out. Unless we nationalize the Federal Reserve, lock up the criminals who own it, cancel the debt, which will then bankrupt the Illuminati, which is exactly what we ought to do, print constitutional money, which cannot be usurped, which cannot lead to our destruction, and go back to, to, to what we're supposed to do, and quit contracting for benefits. We're escaping from the laws of nature, and there's a terrible consequence for that. Mm -hmm. Terrible consequence. Uh, we have to function within the laws of nature. You can't contract for somebody else to keep you alive. You have to be responsible within your life to keep yourself alive. Mm -hmm. And if you can't do it, then you have to die. That's the law of nature. You see. Uh, Kennedy also did a lot of other things. I mean, he was a believer in the Bible. These men who are bringing about the New World Order don't believe in the God of the Bible. They believe in the God of light, Lucifer. 
the angel of light, who was flung down to the earth and became the lord of the world. That's their god. That's why everything they do is, is goes against um, what people know to be the right thing to do. They believe that man was held prisoner by a vindictive, cruel god named Jehovah in the Garden of Eden. And that Lucifer, through his agent Satan, set man free from the bonds of ignorance to which he was chained to the Garden of Eden, and thus brought the gift of intellect, wisdom, to man. And thus is the true benevolent God. And man, with his intellect and his wisdom and his knowledge, will create technology which will elevate man to the position of God. And all this is allegorical. Don't take the, the story literally, you see, because it's all allegorical. They believe that intellect, reason, is the light, mm -hmm. is the true God, is what makes man God. And I'm not going to debate the the, the the right or wrongness of that, because who the hell knows? <laughs> but I can tell you that that um, they pervert whatever it is that might be divine about their philosophy mm -hmm. by becoming what they profess they to want destroy. To destroy, yes. Uh, and so, in their zeal to bring about the new world order, uh, they destroyed the political will of the nation when they assassinated John F. Kennedy which has furthered their goals because it made a lot of people feel so helpless right. that God, if they can kill the president, who am I? You know, what, what can I do? I'm just one lonely, helpless person. So they quit voting. They abdicated their power. And, of course, through agents like Robert Groden and, and many others, uh, Oliver Stone, they're being convinced that our government sucks that our government is the problem, that the Constitution doesn't work, playing, that the Bill of Rights aren't real. We're playing right into their hands, in other words. We're playing right into their hands because there's nothing wrong with the Constitution or the Bill of Rights or our government. The people. You see, it's been it's infiltrated. Amazing. And from within, they are eating at the heart of this nation like a cancer, this secret society. They are destroying it. They are subverting it. Our Constitution has not been allowed to work since 1945 and maybe even earlier. And they have been working behind the scenes to bring about a one-world totalitarian socialist government with the Communist Manifesto as its platform through the United Nations, which was created by this nation from an older organization called the League of Nations, which was the original foundation. And uh, at the highest levels of our government, the Constitution's already been scrapped, and they are working under the aegis of the UN Participation Act and the United Nations Charter. Which says what? Which says that there are no rights, there are only what you, what you call uh, privileges. And privileges can be granted or taken away at will by the state. Quite a frightening scenario. It's a very frightening scenario, and people better wake up to the fact uh, that unless they wake up and do something about it now, there's only going to be one alternative. And that's either take up arms, restore the Constitution, and the blood will run in the streets of America, or reach down and put the shackles around your own feet and march off into slavery peacefully. It's not going to be easy the coming years. Wow. Now historically, this may or may not relate but uh, at least mo modern world, well, uh, contemporary world history does not include the the, uh, um, the stories of Atlantis and Lemuria mm -hmm. that go predate. How does that history and why was that suppressed or why is it still being suppressed? How might that affect what we are understanding is going on today or is it related? Well, I'm not sure if, if a place called Atlantis or Lemuria ever existed or didn't exist. I don't really know. But I do know that the story that is told about the civilizations that live there are something that we should listen to because this whole scene may have played itself out before on this earth. And if you understand the theory, which I believe has been accepted as fact now, of continental drift, mm -hmm. uh, 
there may have been an Atlantis and a Lemuria, which had tremendously developed technologies and societies. And the same scenario that we're playing out now in this great stage called the world may have played itself out over and over again in the past for millennium. Uh, in my investigation of, of the mystery schools, the secret societies that are bringing all this about, that really control everything behind the scenes, um, I found that this is all about religion. And it's all about a recurring theme that is penetrated and is at the heart of every religion in the world. And that is a creator or a creatress who has a son that is sacrificed and then is resurrected and saves the world or saves humanity. It seems to be an archetype that, it, that, is, that is within us. And uh, so that you don't go flipping out watching this tape. I'm a Christian. I believe in the, the, the teachings of Jesus Christ, even though it may turn out that he may have never lived. The, the scene, it doesn't matter. When you read his words, and you can go back through history and find these are the same words that were spoken by every Savior that there ever was, mm -hmm. are the most beautiful, most profound, most, most affecting words that have ever been spoken on the face of this earth. And when I get down and, and almost get to a point of hopelessness, I just go read the Sermon on the Mount. And I come back up again. Because in the end, it's not going to matter whether Jesus ever lived or didn't live. The story is real. And it's within all of us. And uh, it, it brings us to something within ourselves that is good. But these men don't look at that. They believe that the end justifies the means, that these stories are just stories, and that the real meaning behind it all is that man can transcend his animal state through the realization of intellect Correct. and the overcoming of all of his emotions and feelings and uh, morals, guilt, all of these things. And I just can't go along with that because I believe it's our emotions that tell us when we're doing wrong. We feel it within ourselves. And a person without that capacity to feel when they're doing wrong becomes a sociopath, which is someone without a conscience who really believes that the end justifies the means and therefore has no pangs of conscience nor no reluctance to murder someone who gets in their way. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's extremely dangerous. Now, did these people uh, um, recognize the continuity of life? In other words, you have told me earlier that uh, they're after physical immortality. They believe that through their technology, man will become God. With the power of reason, through technology, man will himself become God. They will engineer, just like Hitler wanted to do, the super race who will live forever. And the concept is the same, and the men behind it are the same as Hitler was. When they killed John F. Kennedy, it, it shows you what kind of men they are, because they would not stop to kill anyone who gets in their way. And they've never stopped at it. Their goal, literally, to bring about the New World Order, will be to kill approximately 2 billion people before the year 2000. AIDS is one method of doing this. There will be many more. As they solidify their control, Everyone will be given a choice. They'll be presented with a new world religion. They'll be told to renounce Christ, renounce Buddha, renounce Muhammad, join the new world order, join the new world religion. If they refuse, they'll be executed. Very simple. Um, and it won't bother them a bit. In fact, according to their belief, they believe they'll be helping these people. And in reality, they will. Uh, because those people will transcend this physical state while they're prisoned here living forever. I feel sorry for them because those of us who will eventually die will transcend the pain and the suffering that goes along with, with this world. Mm -hmm. um, and they're so egotistical that they preserve whatever they do so that the diligent can find out what kind of men these men really are. Uh, for instance, the Kennedy assassination, I've been showing a film for five years that shows exactly who did it. I show you exactly where Oswald is on the film. He wasn't even on the sixth floor. He was standing in the doorway of the book depository building watching the motorcade go by. 
and it's it's just it's uh, it's incredible. At the same time, you said they would have everybody renounce religion. Yes. Have they as well been using it as a tool for their means? If you're a Christian, you'll of? be required to renounce Christ and join the New World religion. Now, remember, I told you before. No matter what your religion is or what you think, they are following the scenario in the book of Revelations to a T, right down to the last little bit. If you want to know what's going to happen in the future, if we don't wake up, and through the power of those, see, not one drop of blood ever has to be spilled, and no one has to ever put any chains on their legs or their arms, ever. If people just wake up and exercise what was given to us in our Constitution, the power of the vote, while we still have that power. So you say there is still a possibility for like one individual watching this tape to actually make a difference. You better believe it. How yes. would that be so? Well, number one, learn what the truth really is. Get away from the fantasy that you've been living. Educate other people, those you know, your family. Once that begins to happen, it spreads. And then if the people decide that they don't want what they have in store for us, plan just through the power of the vote, they can make this country and the world whatever they want it to be. Whatever they want it to be. And there are no limits on that, except to understand that you can never make everything all right, and you can never make everything all bad. Both must exist, and we must maintain a balance. Mm -hmm. And we must become responsible. If each individual on this earth learned to walk in a divine state of grace, responsible for themselves, their family, their city, their state, their country, and for the world. And to the laws of nature. And to the laws of nature. And actively participate in solving the problems of yourself, your family, your city, your state, your country, and the world. There could never be a group of men meeting behind closed doors in secret that could ever control Mm -hmm. anybody. But by abdicating responsibility, by not walking in that divine state of grace, makes possible anyone meeting behind closed doors to bring about the world that they want. And the world that they want may not be the world that you want, or that I want, or that these people watching might want. Mm -hmm. If you don't participate, you can't complain. If you don't help cook the meal, you got no right to bitch about it. You got to sit down and eat what's put on your plate. Mm -hmm. If you don't like that, then you should have been in the kitchen helping to prepare the meal, helping to plan it, helping to prepare it, helping to serve it. If you want to sit on your butt in the living room while somebody else prepares the meal for you and decides what it's going to be and puts it on the table, it's too late to say that's not what you wanted to eat. Mm -hmm. It's too late to say it's not cooked the way you wanted it to cook. Well, that's very simple to understand. And that's in, in, right. You've you got to eat it because you have to eat to live. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, that anybody can understand the meaning behind that little story. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's take a step back to the Kennedy thing now. So, this is all about the kids. Well, yeah, it is, it is. Uh, but just specifically about, once again, I want to bring up the film as well. Uh, another thing that, that came to my mind when I viewed it is that the two uh, Secret Service men, the driver and the person sitting next to him in the front, uh, regardless of what they claim happened, uh, obviously did not operate in a way that you were trained as a Secret Serviceman to protect the president. Shouldn't they have just driven that car right out of there and the other guy should have done something to protect or look for uh, uh, who's shooting, you know, it just didn't seem to make any sense. Well, how would the Warren Commission not, they didn't see the film, so I guess They didn't no see the brought. film by design, because if they saw the film, they'd have to be responsible for the decision that they made that Lee Harvey Oswald was a lone assassin. Okay. So I think they didn't see the film on purpose, because they didn't want to have to be responsible for saying, Making hey, look, you, we, the driver did it, you know. They didn't want to make that decision. And in a letter that Lyndon Johnson wrote to the Warren Commission, he specifically said in the letter, you must, you must quickly identify Lee Harvey Oswald as acting alone with no conspiracy so that America can get back to business. Was Lyndon Johnson acting on behalf of the secret society, or oh, was he concerned? Oh, of course. With he had to know all about it and approve of it because he was going to be the new president. 
and the new president would be in charge of the investigation. How high up um, a government official do you have to be before you're briefed of this, you know, the, the total of all the things that are going on, the reality behind them? Well, you have to understand that nobody exists on a high level in government who's opposed to the New World Order. Nobody. Um, our government has literally been infiltrated, and there's a cancer within our government destroying it, eating it, nibbling away at it, hacking off its limbs. And you said this started in 1945? 1945 what was the when, when the overt destruction began to occur when Truman signed the UN Participation Act and the United Nations Treaty. It actually began long before that when these secret societies began to infiltrate the government and appoint their members to important posts. Uh, infiltration is easy. If one gets in, he can then appoint and hire others to replace people who are not members below him. So now we've had over 50, almost 50 years of this going on. At least. I believe that it started back probably 1913, 1917 when the, the Federal Reserve Act was passed, when the Council of Foreign Relations uh, became a reality in this country. Um, and, and you can, by diligent research and study, you can see when it happened, where it happened, who did it, and how it was done. It, it's apparent. When they say there's no conspiracy, I mean, we talk about a conspiracy. It started out as a conspiracy. But when they say today there's no conspiracy, that's not a lie. It's the truth. They're doing it right out in the open, right under our noses, and we're too stupid to know it, to see it. So it's not a conspiracy now, today, mm -hmm. at all. It's right out in the open. They even publish their plans. I mean, here Carter appointed the big new Brzezinski as the national security advisor who just wrote a book before he was appointed declaring himself a Marxist. When you read that book, this man believes in Marxism. This man is a socialist. Mm -hmm. Not only a socialist, he's an international socialist. He's a globalist. His goal stated in his book right. to destroy the sovereignty of nations and bring about a one-world Marxist government. Now, the, the Carter administration was one extreme, and then we came into the Reagan administration, yet... Uh, nothing you, changed. Nothing <laughs> changed. What you're saying is that no matter what the political leanings, they seem to be playing the same game. As long as you're playing their game, it doesn't matter who you vote for, who, who you put in office. They all belong to the other side. They're in the pockets of the Illuminati. When you quit electing professional politicians, when you quit electing the guy who looks nice on television because he speaks good and he looks like the guy you wanted to marry or something yeah. like that, uh, you're, you're playing right into their hands. You know, they made it so impossible for another Abraham Lincoln to get elected to the office of president that it's a wonder that, that, that we even have a chance at all. We need to send people to Congress and to government who are going to clean house. Kick all the members of secret societies out of the bureaucracy. Lock them up. Try them for treason. Because they are traitors. So one thing that may help is term limitations. We must have term limitations, and it must be only one term. And forget all this nonsense that anybody goes to Washington don't know what's happening. They don't know what's happening simply because they haven't taken the time as citizens to understand how our government works before they ever go to Washington. You see, it should be a process that starts in infancy and works its way up. And everybody should be taking part in the government. Now, if someone came in uh, uh, to office with this kind of knowledge and with this kind of intent to, to really pu push these people out, would they not be eliminated immediately? Not if they had the people behind them, because what the people would do in one fell swoop, in one election, would elect people who have never served in government before, kick the incumbents out, send citizens to Washington. And here's the way it has to be done. You know right now, you don't even pay your congressman. You know who pays your congressman? The federal democracy of the District of Columbia. The federal government pays your congressman, who's supposed to be representing your state and you. The federal government is a foreign country to your state. Why should he represent you? Not only that, but he goes, he moves to Washington, D.C. He maintains a residence here, but he doesn't live here. And as long as you reelect him, he continues to live in Washington, D.C., forever, if you keep reelecting him. 
So they lose all touch with what's back here. They're paid by a foreign government, the federal government. They're not paid by the sovereign state of Georgia mm -hmm. or by you. They have to be paid by you. And they have to live here. They can't move to Washington, D.C. They go to Washington, D.C. for one term. Okay? One term only. When that term's up, they have to come back. And you don't pay them exorbitant funds. You pay them just enough to live on comfortably while they're there. Mm -hmm. No fancy giant cocktail parties, none of this crap. And you take care of their family. See, they don't take their family either. That's the other clue. They leave their family here, where they live. Mm -hmm. You, the people of Georgia, take care of their family and their business or their farm or whatever it is they have while they're gone. Now do you think they have a vested interest in representing you? They sure would under those conditions. Yeah. But under the conditions they, have, they, they go under now, they have no interest whatsoever mm. in taking care of you. Now let's look at the current... They're taking <coughs> care of themselves. The current uh, crop of presidential candidates. Is there anybody even running that represents something that we're talking about here? No, all of them are New World people. Songus, in, in, his, in his book, he, even uh, everything that he, he's written touts the New World Order. All of it, right for Songus' literature. They, they, You're going to see New World Order, New World Order, New World Order, New World Order. Clinton, the governor of Georgia, was selected in 1991 well, go by the Arkansas. Bilderberg, or excuse me, gov governor of uh, Arkansas, was selected in uh, 1991 uh, by the Bilderberg Group in Baden-Baden, Germany, to be the new president of the United States. Remember what happened to Gary Hart? What did he do? He went out on a boat with a woman who wasn't his wife, and he was destroyed. Look at Clinton. What's happened to him? Nothing. The press is on his side. They're helping the guy. You know why? Because he was chosen by the people who own the press to be the next president of the United States. Now, I don't know if he will be or not. That's up to the American people. Mm -hmm. But if they get their way, he will be. Bush? Bush is one of the most heinous criminals that's ever walked on the face of the earth. Bush is the man who's been a CIA agent since his college days. He's a member of the Skull and Bones, the Russell Trust. He was initiated in a, in a casket with a ribbon tied around his genitalia. Which, which symbolizes that he's a priest in the Temple of Isis. A pagan, this guy. This man is a member of the mystery schools. Well, he has the outward appearance of a good uh, Christian, church-going Christian, no? They do whatever they have to to be approved by the people, but in secret, they're not at all. This is a man who practices pagan religious rituals, magic. Doesn't matter what you think of all these things. I'm just telling you, this is what he does in secret. Mm -hmm. He is the man who, when he was chief executive officer, when he was president of the offshore division of Zapata Oil, organized and began the first large-scale drug smuggling operations into this country. George Bush is the one responsible for the drugs on the streets. And the war against drugs is not a war against drugs, it's a war against the Bill of Rights. And we've already lost the Fourth Amendment in this war. That's true. And we're going to lose everything else. You watch on, it amazes me, people watch on Saturday night, cops, top cops, tough cops, 911, all of these stories that are glorifying the police state and they're falling right into the manipulation as they watch police with no search warrant, with no court order, break down people's doors, tear out their walls, rip open their mattresses. All in the name of the war on drugs. Pretty sneaky. It's pretty sneaky, all right. You see them stop people in the streets, and the guy's got $400 in his pocket. They don't press, press any charges. They didn't even have any reasonable suspicion to stop the person and search him. And what do they do? They take their money, and they don't give it back. And America's watching this. And the stupid idiots, yes, you, you, <laughs> stupid idiots, you sit there and watch it, not realizing that when you take away that man's freedom, you've also taken away your own. You see, because they can do the same thing to you. Just because you talk a way that they don't like you talking, or because you wear red shoes and they don't like red shoes, they can do the same thing to you. And under the new law, without a court order, without a search warrant, they can break down your door, they can rip open your mattresses, your couches, your walls, they can trash your house. All in the name of the war on drugs. And let's say they don't like the color of your shoes. All they have to do is drop a little pouch 
of cocaine in your living room behind your couch and find it and say, aha, you're a drug dealer. What happens then? Now they can confiscate your house, all your possessions, all your property, all your bank accounts, all your cars, boats, vacation cottages, whatever you have, and they can auction it off within 24 hours without ever even pressing charges against you. Without a court order, without due process, without just comp uh, compensation, and there's not a damn thing that you can do about it. Not a damn thing. At least right now. At least right now. And the reason you can't do a damn thing about it is because you're the one who brought it about through your stupidity. You're mentally crippled. You're operating from a position of ignorance, apathy, abdication, irresponsibility. And we're losing our country, our freedoms, everything. Now these are these are strong accusations of the American public. What what do you hope to accomplish by angering the very audience that you want to watch and listen to you? Go prove me wrong. Go make me the idiot. In so doing, you're going to find out what the truth is, and maybe you'll wake your ass <laughs> up. <laughs> and if you do, maybe we can save our country. Because I don't really care at this point whether you get mad at me or not. My country's disappearing. My freedoms are disappearing. My daughter's going to live as a slave in the New World Order if you people don't wake up and help me. So, if I had a two-by-four, literally, I would smack you upside the head with it. I don't care if you get mad at me. It's beyond that state. You know, I'm willing to put my life on the line. Why would I care if you get mad at me? Mm -hmm. You know? Uh, people say, well, don't you feel threatened? Don't you feel like your life is in danger? Are you kidding? You're the people who sent your sons and daughters to fight an, an illegal, immoral, unjustified war in the Middle East? And that didn't bother you a bit, that they might have got killed over there, and you're worried that I might get hurt or killed? Right here, really defending my country? Mm. Really fighting in defense of the Constitution? Right. You brought up the Persian Gulf War. That's something that's still on a lot of people's minds. Based on what you're saying, should what be. was the they, reason for that war? They should feel really guilty. They should re feel really bad about that. I mean, what about a Saddam Hussein that everyone seems to agree is... is you know, the evil man here that we had the right to go in and punish, destroy, or whatever. Well, it's funny that the man who purported to want to destroy Saddam Hussein was the man who really built Saddam Hussein when he was in the Central Intelligence Agency. We have been building up Saddam Hussein's arsenal. His technology comes from us in the Soviet Union. We built him up to create that war. We did it for a purpose, and the purpose was Look at this. If George Bush knew what he was doing, how come he didn't know what he was doing? Here's what he said. We've got to send troops to the Middle East because we can't afford to pay $26 a barrel for oil. That's on tape. Next he comes out and he says, no, nope, it's not about the price of oil. It's because Saddam Hussein's not going to stop at Kuwait. He's going to go into Saudi Arabia, and those are our friends, our buddies. So we've got to go defend Saudi Arabia. And then James Baker says in a press conference, nope, it's not about Saudi Arabia, it's not about $26 a barrel for oil, it's about jobs. Folks, we're going to get you a job, and to do it, we're willing to kill your sons and daughters. Yes, sir, we're going to send them off to get killed so that you can have a job. Prosperity! That's what it's all about. Well, what was the actual scenario if we hadn't have gone in? What, well, what? see, that's not the end of it yet. Okay. Then George Bush comes out and says, whoa, the White House is flooded for telegrams. They don't want their sons and daughters to get killed for a job. It's not about jobs. It's about naked aggression. Yes, sir, there's a little Hitler over there called Saddam Hussein. Yeah, and raping. we're going to go destroy him because the world doesn't need another Hitler. Never mind Pinochet in Chile, who's another Hitler. Never mind all the other Hitlers in the well, world. Was that Never mind Tiananmen Square. Well, then you know, then people would say, "Well, the American government's not interested in that because money is not in, in uh, you know, it's the oil here. We're talking about money." No. So you're saying it's not even that? No. They've been planning this war for years. In fact, Arco Press wrote a book about it. The name of the book is Rapid Deployment Forces. It was published in 1985. It names Kuwait as the country. It talks about Operation Bright Star where they've been practicing the war every year since the early 80s, sending troops over there, practicing the war, liberating Kuwait. It's even named in the book. The whole thing was spelled out years ago. 
what it was all about was to establish the new world order. You see, because for the first time in the history of the world, it's established the legal international precedent of that the UN. United Nations could pass a resolution and send its police force to enforce that resolution and that the member nations would have to pay for that action. And George Bush said it very clearly, but nobody was listening when he said, no longer will any nation stand against a world united. And with that action, he established the legal foundation in international law that the United Nations is now legally and overtly the one world government. And that the United States military forces and the other forces that were sent by other countries were established as the one world police force under the United Nations. Have you seen the new Air Force uniforms yet? Nowhere on them does it say United States or U.S. They are United Nations uniforms. Go look at them. Mm. What role um, in the Middle East again does Israel play in this? Israel was created as the instrument to bring about the Battle of Armageddon and the fulfillment of prophecy. A war that will be so terrible where nuclear weapons will be used so that the American citizens and the other people of the world will get down on their knees and beg for no more war. And what is the answer to that? They're going to be told the only way we can guarantee no more war is if we destroy the sovereignty of nations and we come together as one humanity in a one world government. Right. Now I'm telling you, unless the American people wake up and stop it, starting in about 1996, the Battle of Armageddon will become a reality. And the Not U because two nations got mad at each other and decided to fight. And that's why Saddam Hussein was not destroyed. He will be the instrument that will bring that to pass. Right. Yeah, they purposely Saddam did Hussein, not go in and do that. Saddam Hussein will be portrayed as the Antichrist. Babylon is in Iraq. Mm -hmm. Read the book of Revelations. Whether you believe in the book or not, read it because the They're men who are it. bringing this about are using it as their script. Well, the UN did indeed charter Israel as a, as a sovereign nation. They were the ones who created this state. That is correct. It was really created by Great Britain and the United States, with the United States being the major major well, instrument. Okay, and the, the Jewish people were then being manipulated into believing it was for some other reason. That's correct. They've always been manipulated. And I get people who still come to me all the time and say, Bill, you're all wrong, it's the Jews. The Jews are subverting the world. Man, it's not the Jews, it's not the Catholics, it's not the blacks. It's these men who belong to the ancient mystery schools, who meet in secret and decide the fate of the world. And they belong to all different races and all different nationalities and all different religions to the public point of view. But in secret, it's a different story. How about the European community? Here seems, based on your theory, another uh, group of sovereign nations coming together to form one government. The European community, the EEC, was created by the Central Intelligence Agency working through a lodge in Italy called the P2 Lodge. Propaganda 2 is the name of it, which is the intelligence arm of the Vatican. And Prince Barnard, who is the leader of the secret World Council that controls these secret societies around the world, called the Bilderberg Group. And that's the truth of the matter. Hmm. And, uh, well, during its creation, uh, they, they, they just threw out Margaret Thatcher. She was really opposing this. Yes, she was, and that's why she got ousted. Okay. So did the Shah of Iran. So did Marcos. Anyone who opposes it gets ousted. That wasn't an overthrow of Marcos by the people in the Philippines. It was organized, instigated, and carried out by agents of the Central Intelligence Agency and the KGB. The overthrow of the Shah of Iran, our intelligence community, is trying to tell us they didn't know anything about it. They didn't know what was happening. Bullshit. They organized it. They instigated it. They are the ones who caused it to come to pass. Mm -hmm. You see, because we didn't have a national security agency or a central intelligence agency before the UN Participation Act was signed. And these organizations were created to bring about the one world government, the new world order. 
and it had to be done in a manner that the people would not know that it was being done, and the only way they could do that was hide it behind the veil of national security. And the Cold War was a manipulation maintained to bleed the people of tax dollars to fund the creation of the police force of the New World Order, which is the Army, Navy, and Air Force and Marines of the United States and the Soviet Union. And the people didn't rise up in the Soviet Union and overthrow communism. It came from the top down because it had to be done. There has to be a bringing to the same level of all the peoples of the world to well, approximately the same political viewpoint so there's not big disparity in order to be able to justify the merger of all these countries together. Well, who now is ruling the forces of the former Soviet Union? You have Yeltsin in now. Gorbachev went, supposedly went down, but we're not sure about that. Well, let me tell you this. From the beginning, there was never any war between the United States and the Soviet Union. It was created by those at the top to fund the New World Order and the New World Order's police force. At the highest level of all countries, they all belong to the same club. And we, the people, sit back and we watch this grand drama which is being played out for our benefit, mm -hmm. not theirs. If it wasn't for us, they wouldn't even have to do any of this. But you see, they just can't come out and destroy all of us because they need slaves. They need people to make their shoes and make their cars and mine the ore. They need worker bees, and that's what we are. In the New World Order, we will be the worker bees, the slaves. So the Orwellian view of the vision of the future wasn't too far off based on this scenario. George Orwell was just like me. He was a low-level member of British intelligence who was appointed to a position high enough where he saw the same documents that I saw. And he tried to warn the world just like I'm trying to warn the world, only he wasn't willing to take the risk that I'm willing to take. So he wrote it in a book called 1984 and spelled out exactly what's coming as a warning to the people of the world, as a work of fiction. But you notice that that work of fiction really stirred people up because they knew that it wasn't fiction. In their heart of hearts, everyone who's read that book knows that it's coming. But it's a possibility. Most people won't recognize it overtly or publicly because then if they recognize it, they have to be responsible to do something about it. And that's what every one of you have been resisting all your life, is being responsible to do something about it, to get involved. That's why you'll walk away from a girl being raped on the street by a gang of thugs rather than go and try to help her. And I'm not talking to all of you. I know there's some of you out there just like me. But most of you are just exactly what I've just described. Most people are no better than animals who do not have intelligence because they don't use their intelligence. And to these men who control things behind the scenes, mm -hmm. you are stakes on the table by choice and consent and will always be ruled and manipulated and enslaved by people who do use their brains. Mm. As long as we're debunking some myths, because it's putting pieces of this puzzle together, I think, for a lot of people that may be watching. Um, the the hostage situation in Iran that threw, that got Carter out of office, is this another orchestration? And if so, how does it fit into the... October the surprise is no myth. There was a deal made. There was a deal made at the highest levels to keep the hostages until after Reagan was elected. Do you really believe that it was an accident, that it was a coincidence, that 30 minutes after Ronald Reagan was sworn in, took his oath of office, the hostages were released? Did they want Carter out? Are you really out? that naive? I can't believe it. <laughs> did, did they want Carter out? Yes, they wanted Carter out. They wanted Carter out. He wouldn't play the, the, by the rules? Or what I don't know why they wanted him out, but they wanted him out. Carter was ineffective. He did not have the support of all the American people. Um, they need people who can manipulate the American people so that they have their support. My message is to you is don't support anybody unless they're doing what we know to be right. Don't believe them. Don't fall for the manipulations. Double check everything they say. <laughs> and that means you can't rely on the media as it is today either. Oh, of course not. All the media in this country 
radio, television, and print is all owned by five corporations. All of these corporations that own the media are owned and controlled, and members of the Council on Foreign Relations sit on their board of directors. Can you name those five corporations? Is that... Yeah, not off the top of my head. Okay. I, I could try, but I don't want to take a chance on being uh, inaccurate. But you can trace that yourself. Okay. Remember, if you go down and you trace the ownership of a station or a newspaper, and you get to a corporation. Remember that somebody owns that corporation, and it's usually another corporation. But when you, when you trace the interlocking of all these things, when you get to the top, there's five. And all journalists know that there's some things you don't write about, and you don't talk about, because you'll lose your job. And that's where the control is. And that's why they pay anchormen like Dan Rather $2 million a year, because he doesn't question them. He knows that if he goes against them, he's going to lose $2 million a year. Do you think a man that looks pretty and sits in front of a TV camera for the 6 o'clock news is worth $2 million a year? No way. I don't care how long he works, and I don't care what he does. There is no job worth $2 million a year. That's why they pay athletes these fantastic salaries. I was listening to the radio the other day. They just contracted to pay... One, one player on one team, $6 million a year. Can you believe this? And why is that? It's the Roman circus. What does the emperor do when the people become restive and when the people are asking questions and when the people don't like the policies of the emperor? He sends them to the circus. He creates a circus. He builds a giant coliseum. And he begins to throw the Christians to the lions. And he has great chariot races and football games and basketball games all to keep the idiots preoccupied with things that don't mean anything in the scheme of the entire world so that they don't have the time to learn what the truth is so they don't ever get smart enough to learn how they're being manipulated so they don't ever question the emperor that's why they pay a player on a football team or a baseball team a million or two million or three million dollars a year. It is the Roman circus. I know men who don't know anything in the world except who plays third base for the Mets. And they think that's a great accomplishment. And they meet and pat each other on the back and bond and go have cocktails and talk about what this guy that plays third base for the Mets did in last night's game. sad. It's really sad. Is there any room in, in, uh, in a kind of society where these manipulations are not taking place for this type of entertainment or any type of entertainment at all? If people understand that a game is a game, if people understand that nobody, nobody, no matter what they do, is worth paying two or three million dollars a year for, people should be able to get rich if they want to. Mm -hmm by the sweat of their individual labor, okay? By going out and doing something for the world. Mm -hmm. Not by taking people's minds away from the emperor. It's a game. Football's a game. Football's a game. But let me tell you something. When 150 of the most powerful men and women in the world can meet in secret in Baden-Baden, Germany, and plot the fate of billions and nobody even cares about it but six football players go to lunch together and it's in the headlines across the country you have a reflection of the society in which that exists and it is a sick sick society that it's doomed to self-destruction so based on that scenario there's some truth into what these these men are looking at absolutely and that's what makes me so sick is that I'm trying to wake up a people who on a daily basis are proving the ones that I'm warning them about to be right. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it, so that even though a minority, there are people out there that you recognize are awake to this, if they don't do something about it, they will lose that ability to be free in that way. That's correct. Whether they might think, well, I don't need to worry about it because I know what I know and I'm fine. That's it right. doesn't work that way. There's yes. a connection here to everything. That is correct. That is absolutely correct.
a nation of people who are willing to send their sons and daughters that they profess that they love to a foreign country to die and they use the excuse to themselves that they're sending them off to defend our country and they know damn well that's a lie are doomed hmm. it's, it's funny there's a parable uh, you said Ben Franklin earlier was even a part of this yes um, a parable of Ben Franklin, I, I don't know if you're familiar with it, he paid too much for the whistle. He came up when he was a young boy. Are you familiar mm -hmm. with that parable? No, go ahead. Uh, where, he, when he was a young boy, he was given an allowance. And, you know, it was, it was a decent amount of allowance. And he was going to the, to the store to get a toy. You know, he was very excited about that. And along the way, he met some boys who had this whistle. You know, and he and he saw that, and he saw the little boys blowing this whistle, and he thought, "Wow, the greatest whistle! I, this is the greatest toy." He really wanted this thing, mm -hmm. so without asking, he gave all his money away, you know, to these boys for this whistle. And he went home, and and sure enough, he got very bored with it, and he had no more money to buy something that was really, you know, worthwhile to him. Sure. And so from that point on, he had a saying that said, "You know, don't pay too much for the whistle." And I think somehow that relates here. He's also the one, when the Constitutional Convention was finished, when they, when they wrote the Constitution and signed it, when it had been signed, he walked out the doors. Someone outside, I forget who it was, I believe it was a reporter for one of the newspapers in the 13 colonies, asked him, he said, what have you wrought, Ben? Ben looked at him and he said, a republic, if you can keep it. He knew. He did. Mm. And that's a good place to end. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> that's a great ending. <laughs> wow. Good job, guys. All right, Bill. Yo. Yo. Fantastic. Good. Thanks, Bill. Push your towel. Right there. Yeah, these lights are roasting Sorry. me. Man. Cool. I've already had my son. I'm ready for a bath. <laughs> You know, the, the, the major media is great at putting out the propaganda because, you know, this this meme out there, this idea put out by the, made, the mainstream media that uh, we have, the, the people have no choice because, after all, you just can't let them fail. You know, the government has to bail them out because it would be much worse to just let them fail. And... Um, this is remarkable because the major mainstream media have gotten the American public to buy into policies that guarantee their their impoverishment, and um, it, it's it's just a testament to the to the triumph of mainstream media to push out any dissenting voice or any debate or any kind of public service that you would think would be inherently obligatory for a public airwave to um, hear, adhere to. Uh, they've been, the, the public airwaves, which started out as a public utility more or less, have been of course co-opted by corporate, the corporate uh, agenda, and now serve purely at the behest of the propaganda meisters in, in the Washington and in the banking system, who put out these ridiculous, these ludicrous ideas that, oh, we just can't let them fail. And um, anybody who now has seen their monthly income go uh, drop by 90% due to the uh, drop in short-term interest rates by the by the banking system the people who are now starving because their monthly income has been slashed by 80 or 90 percent these people have had their monthly income slashed for no reason other than to bail out these bankers so when you say that well we couldn't let them fail you have to understand that simultaneously you have to understand that you the individual who's had your monthly income slashed are the is where the money is coming from you are subsidizing the Merrill Lynch bonuses and the Wall Street bonuses. And, and not only have you had your money stolen, but then you turn around and defend the crooks. And this has got to be uh, the very nature of this whole idea of the Stockholm Syndrome, where 
the person who's been kidnapped falls in love with their captor. The American people have been kidnapped by the banking system, and now they're defending the banking system while the banking system steals their money in the form of driving interest rates low to bail out banks who have kept afloat this enormous slush fund scheme, unnumbered accounts that are uh, simply there to launder money, uh, launder losses.